Good afternoon. My name is Seth Butner, and I have the honor to serve as this year's president of the Rotary Club of Oakland. Founded in 1908, the Rotary Club of Oakland is the third oldest Rotary Club of some 35,000 Rotary Clubs throughout the world. We are a community of 300 men and women from all walks of Oakland civic, commercial, and community life, committed to the Rotary motto of service above self. I'd like to welcome you to our 5,334th club meeting. <laughs> For over 111 years, we have welcomed Rotarians and guests from around the world to our club meetings. We continue to do so virtually. So if you're a visiting Rotarian, or if you're a guest of a Rotarian, please let us know by typing your name or the name of your club in the chat box at the center bottom of the screen as indicated by the red arrow on the slide you're viewing now. By doing so, you, we will be able to recognize you later in this meeting. Also, we recommend that all participants view this Zoom meeting by clicking the speaker view button located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And if you have comments throughout the meeting or questions of the speaker, please use the chat button at the bottom of the screen for that as well. And now for our thought for the day, Rotor Act member uh, Diana Garcia. Is she here? Hi, everyone. I'm here. Mm -hmm. How's everybody doing today? Hello, Diana. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Rotary Club, for inviting us to be here today. And my thought of the day um, will start with a quote with Selena, whose uh, death anniversary was yesterday, 26 years ago. We lost an amazing artist. Um, and the quote is, I want to be remembered not only as an entertainer, but as a person who cared a lot. And I gave the best that I could. I tried to be the best role model that I possibly could. I love this quote uh, because it says that she wants to be remembered as a person who cared a lot. You know, in this world, a lot of times we care a lot about titles and what we've done and our accomplishments and things like that. But really the, the most valuable um, aspect that we have as human beings is the ability to care and have empathy towards one another. That's my thought of the day. Thank you, Diana, for setting the tone for our meeting as the Rotaract member, Thank uh, you. taking over our club meeting this week. <laughs> Uh, because we want to remain grounded and focused, we begin our meetings by jointly reciting our vision, which is, together we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. I hope you uh, enjoyed last week's meeting where we had the speaker, uh, documentary filmmaker, Abby Ginsberg, spoke about her recent film, waging change that deals with the minimum wage issue in tips and restaurants business. It was quite a lively discussion and I only wish I had allowed more time for questions and discussion and answers. She, we went on for another 10 minutes after the meeting, after I closed the meeting with Abby, she was gracious enough to stick with us. It was really nice. But uh, this week we will feature our road ride group as uh, evidenced by Rotary uh, person uh, member uh, Diana Garcia, who gave our thought for the day. After a little bit of club business, I'll turn over the meeting to them. I think you'll enjoy the program that they arranged for you, and we'll see how Rotaract's doing coming up. So sit back, enjoy another in our Civic Thursday meetings where you can catch a great speaker and get involved with Rotary where service above self exists. Past president, governor, past district governor, <laughs> past president and district governor. Do we have any visiting Rotarians, I guess? Well, how you doing, uh, Seth? I was just about to show you uh, this blank page here, but one of our uh, many Rotor actors actually checked into our chat, and so he deserves to be introduced. Do we have the uh, treasurer of uh, Community Rotor Act, Ivy Chin, with us? So. Uh, uh, my page is no longer blank. Welcome, Ivy and Rotaractors, to our meeting. Thank you, Ed, and welcome to all guests, all Rotaract actors that are here.
today as well. We have a tradition of uh, transitioning our red badge new member to blue badge fully engaged member when that member completes certain tasks. They have to go through our new member orientation. They have to join a committee and they have to make a giving commitment to the Rotary Foundation and the Oakland Rotary Endowment. And finally, they need to give a three minute self introduction. Today, we have Rotarian Greg Knight giving his three minute introduction. Greg. Thank you, President Sess. Um, just so you guys know, we are we have no Comcast connectivity on our block right now, so I'm trying this for my phone. But thank you, and fellow Rotarians, thank you for allowing me a few minutes today to formally introduce myself. It's no coincidence that I picked April 1st, April Fool's Day, um, but I will get to that in a moment. As President Sess said, I'm Greg Knight, and I joined Oakland Rotary in June of 2019. My husband Randy and I have actually been involved with various uh, Rotary events and fundraisers over the years. My younger brother joined right out of college and several of our friends and family members are Rotarians. When Celeste Gordon and Winter Williams invited us to join a meeting or to attend a meeting and join, it was a simple yes. Since joining Rotary, I've had the opportunity to work with a few of you and that's mostly because of the pandemic put a, a damper on things. Um, I've worked with Karen Friedman and her group at Laney College with the food drive. I've helped with wine sales when we had in-person meetings, and hopefully that gave Julie Fox a break. And I was even on the 2020 Gala Committee for food and beverage, but as you all know, we didn't need any food and beverage for our 2020 Gala, unfortunately. Currently, I'm the co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, along with Celeste Gordon. Over the course of my working career, as so many did, I started in fast food. So last week's meeting was particularly interesting for me. I worked the night shift at a Taco Bell drive-through and I also worked in a family restaurant, a pizza restaurant, which was really a lot of fun. And I enjoyed that a lot. I also worked as a lifeguard during the summers um, at a special needs facility. And let me tell you in West Virginia during the summer that was hot, humid work, but the pool at the end of the day was a bonus. I spent 10 years abroad in Japan, first as a teacher and then as a paralegal with a global law firm. I was missing the Bay Area and decided in September of 2001 to finish the year in Japan and transfer from the Tokyo office to our San Francisco office. What timing that was. Around that time that I was planning to leave Japan, I also became uh, very interested in personal finance because it was the first time in my life that I actually had more money than month. So I enrolled in and completed a program of study in personal financial planning and continued to work in a related field as an equity paralegal until the end of 2011. I took some time off. I went back to school and finished another degree. And in 2016, I decided to sit for the certified financial planner exam. This exam has a very low national pass rate and earning a CFP designation is very challenging, but I did it. Which brings me back to April Fool's Day. I picked April 1st for my introduction because April is National Financial Literacy Month here in America. Did you even know we have such a thing? I work as a fee-only certified financial planner. Working as a fee-only planner means that I don't sell you products and I don't earn a commission on any of my recommendations. As a fee-only certified financial planner, I enjoy working with people who want to improve their finances and reach their goals. Financial literacy is hugely important in our lives and to me. It's why I started my own firm, Engage Advising, and why I work with people on an ongoing basis over time. This month, since it's National Financial Literacy Month, I invite you all to challenge yourself to learn a new personal finance concept or to explore your own goals and your own personal financial situation. And of course, if I can be of service, just give me a call. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we appreciate that, uh, as always. Um, uh, when we return to in-person meetings, your shiny new blue badge will be indicating your completion of permanent member requirements is waiting on you. Congratulations. Uh, we can all clap or do this, so uh, one or the other. <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Greg. And uh, Greg, as he mentioned, he's also chairing the uh, uh, DEI committee. And I know they got plenty of work ahead of them to do. 
Now we have a uh, past president of ORAE, Jim Caponegro is with us today to speak about the Oakland Rotary Endowment Campaign. Thank Jim. you, President Sess. I appreciate that. Uh, Sandeepa, if you could put the slides up, that would be great. I'm here, I'm a member of the Oakland Rotary Board and uh, the chair of the fundraising committee. So as we get going on our ORE campaign for the year, um, I, I wanted to uh, just kind of kick that off. So Sandeepa, if you could put the slides up, that'd be great. No, there we go. There we go. So I want to talk a little bit about the Oakland Rotary Endowment um, and, and what we do. And uh, the beauty of today's talk is I'm going to then pass it over to John Holmgren, who is going to really dig deep into one of our programs uh, that the dollars go to. So um, next slide, Sandeepa. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about was when you generously donate to the Oakland Rotary Endowment, uh, we, we really contribute into our community. Over the past five years, we've given over a million dollars to local and international communities. And that million dollars includes 50 grants that we've given to just local nonprofits through the Community Services Committee. Um, and and uh, those 50 grants go to Oakland specific nonprofits. And the rest of the dollars go into these other committees that a lot of members at and in our club really focus and, and contribute to, including uh, kinder prep that we will be talking about today. Next slide, please. Just over the past year, the Oakland Rotary Endowment has provided a lot of dollars and a lot of activities to uh, different things, including new books for summer program rating, uh, dollars for teachers and for, class, for classroom supplies, uh, we give scholarships for first generation college students, and we've also contributed uh, emergency COVID relief and homeless uh, into the homelessness camps uh, around the Oakland area. So uh, if you didn't hear it already, I want everybody to know that uh, President Sess has provided a $50,000 uh, to match our first $50,000 coming into the program for the ORE campaign. Um, the campaign will go for the next month or so, and we will keep everybody updated on how we're doing. And into our, my last slide here, Sandeepa, is uh, just so everybody knows how they can contribute to our campaign. Go to the Oakland Rotary um, page, click on the donation. You can go right to the donation uh, page, or you can click on the donation button on our Oakland Rotary. When you come up to that donation button, you'll see that there's two choices. I want you to click on the mm -hmm. Oakland Rotary Endowment or today um, or in any weeks ahead, you can make a pledge into the today's chat for any dollar amount that you wish to give. And again, we're doing a matching up to $50,000. Um, what's really great is to really hear about the different programs uh, and how we spend those dollars. So I want to turn it over to John Holmgren. He's going to talk about one of our programs, one of our committees, the Kinder Prep program and how we help our Oakland community for Kinder Prep. Great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, if you wanna support our community, what better thing can you do than to support underserved youth? That's the spirit that drives the Kinder Prep committee. For many years, this committee, formerly called the Youth and Education Committee, has supported transitional kindergarten classrooms in underserved neighborhoods. This support has taken several forms. Field trips to Oakland Fairyland, Oakland Zoo and, Ch and Chabot Space Center. Many members of our club have participated as chaperones during these expeditions. These trips were ably organized by Rotarian Scott Bowie. Gift cards for transitional kindergarten teachers at Lakeshore Learning to enable them to purchase supplies for their classrooms. Without this support, teachers were using their own money to make these purchases. Summer book program. For many years, we have provided a summer book pack of five or six language appropriate books to all transitional kindergarten students so that their learning could continue until the fall. This program has been ably managed by Rotarian Mike Maury. We have provided classroom volunteers in classrooms to support teachers. 
Speaking from personal experience, I can say that parent volunteers are a rarity in the classrooms we serve because the children are often from households in which both parents work full time. Our support can take the form of reading, helping with the classroom learning activity, or just taking a student who is having a moment aside so that his issues do not distract from the learning process of the other students. Our attendance program, spearheaded by Rotarian Bill Hogan, made a big difference in attendance at the Garfield, Brookfield, New Horizon, and Rise schools, which saw absenteeism drop from 10 to 12% to mid single digits. Better attendance not only supports student learning, but also improves the financial position of schools. That last slide you saw was David Stein doing what it took to distract children uh, during a particular classroom activity. Our wish list program gave teachers the opportunity to request financial support up to $500 to purchase resources for their classrooms that would enhance the learning environment. Teachers have taken advantage of this program to purchase such things as kid appropriate furniture, playhouses and quiet time blankets. In this challenging year, the Kinder Prep Committee had to pivot to providing support in a distance learning environment. Rising to the challenge, we have so far provided virtual learning kits for 600 students in 35 classrooms to make it easier for teachers to conduct virtual learning classes and contributed 25,000 to FOPSL, so that stands for Friends of Oakland Public Schools Libraries, to help fund a transitional kindergarten appropriate virtual library. Many schools do not have libraries and never will because of the cost to establish them. So our support for a virtual library will support schools for years to come, even after the pandemic. In the last week, we have secured ORC and ORE board approval to purchase remote learning science kits for 200 students from local nonprofit Kids Cubed. This will enable teachers to conduct science lessons to the many students who will continue to be in a virtual learning environment for much of the remaining school year. We also secured board approval for a virtual playgroups program designed by the nonprofit Bananas to facilitate socialization for students in the absence of classrooms. This program will be implemented should it become evident that the recent return to classrooms is not providing sufficient opportunities for student interaction. I believe that the support we provide to Oakland youth is one of the jewels in the crown of our club. Your contributions to ORE enable this to happen. That's why I am a major contributor to ORE. Thank you all for supporting ORE. Thank you, John. We appreciate that and all that you do uh, to make the Kinder Prep uh, program uh, run smoothly. My pleasure. Uh, that's a tall task that you uh, operate on from there. And uh, you too, Jim, uh, for uh, heading up this campaign for us uh, this year. We, uh, we really want to get it started, kicked off uh, here today. So if you put your pledge in chat or uh, visit the re website, uh, we'll make sure we make a successful campaign before this is over. And now to remind us of the culmination of the campaign, at the end of the, the campaign, we're going to have our gala event. And Kathleen Sims is going to tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Sess. As a relatively new Rotarian, I'm excited to share our plans for the 2021 gala. I'm the owner of a Remax real estate firm dedicated to help helping Black Americans buy a home, a big challenge in Oakland. So I've observed the support that Rotary provides in our community and was happy to help organize the gala. This year, we're hosting a virtual casino night. The focus is on fun and fundraising. You'll have a fun night packed with your bids at blackjack, roulette, and craps, and enjoying the music we have planned. So mark your calendar for May 22nd. To make this a super fundraiser, we're also looking for donations for um, auction donations. Vacation homes are a big hit, but consider donations for a spa day, sports memorabilia, golf lessons for kids, or air travel tickets or pool your resources and donate together. And I, lastly, I wanna thank Christine Watson and Lorna Padilla-Marcus and Jesse for their help with the gala preparation. We ha they have been terrific. Stay tuned for more details next week. I'm not telling you all the details yet. <laughs> uh, save something for later. <laughs> 
Now, as I promised, uh, Rotorac is going to take over this uh, meeting. Who's the first one to speak? Is it you, Diana? Yes, it is me. Thank you, okay. Seth. And uh, it's just amazing to hear all the amazing things that are happening within Rotary and the youth programs. Um, I'm Diana Garcia. Um, I'm actually a HOPE mentee, so I, I know firsthand um, what it's like to experience um, that, that help from Rotary and growing up in, in the Oakland public school systems. Um, I'm also the acting vice president of Oakland Community Rotaract and immediate past president. I am very grateful to have brought this amazing team together and to have built these relationships over the last two years. We have um, created, we have done a number of service events. Um, we brought together resources from the community at one point last year, and we were able to collect to make a bunch of food and go out and feed to um, feed some people. We've also been collaborating with uh, Oakland Frontline Healers, which is a big uh, network of a lot of nonprofits here in Oakland, California, that are doing a lot of work. Um, and my experience in Rotaract has has been of growth and um, inclusion with the team um, as we have been building to to do as much as we can for our communities in these times that can be very trying. Um, and now I'm, I'm going to pass it to uh, our president, Devonte Brooks. Hi everyone, uh, Devonte Brooks here. I am serving as president of Oakland Community Rotaract and also as a former HOPE mentee, uh, my thought process was always trying to pay it back. And this entire experience has been uh, really hefty with the learning that has resonated through the different realms of my own life. So some of those things including stumbling over the bureaucratic hurdles, uh, interacting and actively working with established professionals and instead of refining my own capacities for taking on these opportunities. The concept of service above self is a practice that has helped shift my mindset that coincides seamlessly with my still developing career as a professional artist with a focus on social justice. And having the support of my fellow board members and Rotarians has made my pursuit of paying it back more focused and impactful. And I'm gonna pass it on to Ivy Chen. Hello everyone, thank you so much to our president, uh, Devonte Brooks. Um, my name is Ivy, I'm the current treasurer of Oakland Community Rotaract. Since club is quite small. I also wear a lot of different hats. I also provide photography and videography for the club as well. When I first joined Rotaract, I wasn't really sure what it was about. Uh, I think I've heard of it during high school in the Interact, um, but Rotary at large, it was in 2019 when I first joined that I got a really big mind-blown moment that this club does so much. And the slogan, service above self, is just something that I've been trying to mold into my own personal growth. I think throughout uh, just working with this ragtag team of people, Diana, Devante, Claudia, and even Winter, like it's been extremely, extremely rewarding. I also really want to give a great shout out to Gay and Mark and Kevin Coleman for also being a part of our growth for this entire process. Uh, 2021 has been off with pick uh, with all the projects that we're planning to do uh, and appreciate Rotary, Oakland uh, Rotary Club to provide this for us to kind of share and meet us for what our team is about uh, and just want to say thank you so much to the sponsor groups um, and now I'd like to ask Claudia. Are you available, Claudia? Well, why don't you take over, uh, Devante? Uh, absolutely. Um, just to give a bit on Claudia. She is our secretary uh, serving now. Um, she is bring. She brings a lot of positive energies and a lot of uh, organizational aspects from her job that help keep us in line and do best with getting the events planned, prepared and executed. Um, and that's a bit on her, but there'll be opportunity to get to know her a little more from herself. 
But moving forward, I do want to introduce our guest speaker for the day, Tim Hahn. Tim, you take it away. Hello, everybody. Hi, my name is Tim Hahn. I'm with uh, a local art group called Illuminaries. I'm extremely honored to uh, be here to share a little bit. Um, and I do have some slides here, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Everybody see my screen? Yeah. All right. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, art around Oakland, um, share a little bit about my story, my journey, um, going from a graffiti artist, um, getting into a lot of trouble to um, becoming a mural artist and, and learning how to look outside myself into the community. And so your guys' uh, service over self really, uh, really resonates with me um, in preparing these slides. So um, I wanna encourage anyone to go ahead and chat any questions along the way. I, I would love to hear any, any feedback or, or questions as I go, um, or you can save them till the end, whatever you guys want. Uh, this is me that you might've seen the uh, Oakland elephant. This is probably our biggest mural to date. It might be the biggest in Oakland, I think. It's about uh, 90 feet tall on uh, 19th and Webster. And I will talk a little bit about how we did that. Um, these are some of the guys I work with. Illuminaries, we're a group of, you know, five, six, sometimes 10 guys. Um, uh, we're all come from the graffiti art background and just trying to make a difference in our community now by giving back and creating murals that uh, inspire people as opposed to, you know, just promoting ourselves. And, you know, so this is where it all started. Um, 96, 97, 98, graffiti was in full swing and um, I just got sucked into that uh, lifestyle. It was a lot of fun at the time and looking back, it was very dangerous. But, uh, you know, my parents, um, they stuck with me. They didn't, <laughs> you know, I got into, you know, one day at dinner, uh, had a knock on the door and the police came through my house in Berkeley and, uh, you know, got into a lot of trouble. And that was back in, you know, graffiti was a real problem back then in 99. And there was a real crackdown. And, uh, you know, we just were focused on ourselves. And graffiti is really about self-promotion. And, and you're just writing your name everywhere. And it's very juvenile. But it did, uh, you know, that getting in trouble uh, did something to me. I learned how to... Uh, I took my skills to the computer and I learned graphic design and programming. And I went that route for a little while um, until, uh, you know, and eventually it took us to the point of uh, being on the, the same side of, of the law. And this is one of our uh, pieces um, in Oakland that it was just such, it's such a cool transitional point at this point in my life that police were coming by to take pictures with our mural and they're asking us to paint their locker rooms and, and all this stuff and it was um yeah so th this was you guys may have seen this mural but this was uh, a big transition also to see the effects on community and um and and how it affected that the community um because this this uh particular piece let's see if i have a slide here this particular piece um it you know we the this is 2015 the warriors were doing well and there were no murals, no murals in Oakland at all about with the Warriors. And they, you know, it was the first time in, in decades that they are winning. And so we thought to ourselves, we need to put a mural up. And uh, we, we spotted this building. And I don't know if you guys know where this is. This is uh, at the 980 entrance um, uh, off of Telegraph. And it was like a, it was kind of like a, a a broken down building. I believe there's probably homeless or drug users inside. Um, just, just trash and needles all over the place. It had, this place has not been used for a long time. And I uh, saw someone gardening there and I said, Hey, can we want to paint this building? And he said, uh, well, go ahead. Well, the owner lives out of state or something like that. And we just showed up and, and just painted it. Didn't ask anyone. And the neighbors just started coming out, giving us drinks and food and they're just like we appreciate you guys doing this um because it really turned that that area around it was it was real bad um just collected a lot of uh, homeless and and trash so that was like the first time that opened my eyes to like wow 
uh, maybe art can have some positive changes here because this was early on in, in our career. And so this is really what got us down this path of thinking about um, how, you know, how can we affect change? How can we bring joy to people's uh, day? You know, even just a little smile, that, that's the whole reason why we're doing this at this point. And the other cool thing was that the next day after that mural came out, uh, Steph Curry, so this is called the Fizz Face. It's a pioneer by a gentleman named Mac Dre, who was a big artist in the Bay Area who passed away, rest in peace. Um, but so this was the Fizz Face and, and everyone was like, I've never seen Curry do that. He did that the next day. And we did find out later, I met Curry um, a year later and I asked him, I was like, you guys did that because of the mural, right? He did that because of the mural. I was like, yep, exactly. So that was, that was kind of a cool moment. Um, and, you know, and so just having uh, those ideas about community and what art can, can be really uh, changed how we looked at uh, painting and, and the effects that we could have. And just, you know, we have buildings all over the city and just a thin layer of paint, you know, just spending a couple hours can, can have such a big impact as you guys know, the, the murals are popping up all over Oakland. It's been years since, since that's happened. It's just so cool to, to see uh, people, um, you know, putting their time into doing it right, you know, versus 10, 15 years ago. I mean, obviously there's still a lot of graffiti everywhere, but to see it now where people are taking their time and really honing their skills uh, to me is, is very inspiring. And um, so, so what happened was, uh, you know, after that, that uh, Warriors piece, we just did that one for free. We finally got the the, tra the Warriors uh, after a year or two. Steph um, got we got his attention, and he they hired us to do a couple other pieces. This is the one off 880. This is actually the first one we did for Under Armour, um, and and since then we we did uh, many pieces for Steph, probably uh, probably a dozen or so projects, and so that was uh, a lot of fun to get you know, to get that kind of attention. Um, we eventually got to got to paint the first, so the first Marriott in the world with uh, street art on the front, that's that's here in, here in Oakland. And um, we were, you know, had the, the blessing, you know, had, had the great opportunity to do that. And so that's, uh, that's it right there. You guys may have seen that. Um, and this, these are just some other slides early in our career, you know, people were asking us to do like just graffiti in their living rooms. And I just couldn't understand it. You know, this was like a big shift. And this is someone's living room here in a $900,000 house in Oakland Hills. And, uh, you know, that was a big shift in, in our society is starting to, uh, you know, um, accept street art, accept graffiti as not something gang related, you know, coming from where we came from, it was always viewed as gang related and something dangerous. And so, you know, people started wanting these in their living room. And so it was, we were just blown away that um, we could actually possibly make a career out of this, that um, this stuff that we'd always been doing for free and illegally, and now people were paying us to do it. Um, and so we, we started doing a lot of things. We like painting animals and um, dogs and stuff. and this is for uh, this is for a guy who invented uh, a piece of uh, the safety harness on a parachute. This is in his garage. Um, this is in San Francisco. So yeah, you know, I like to paint a lot of dogs and animals. Tim, we got a question that uh, said we'd like to hire you to put a mural on our side of our building. How oh yeah. How do they get in touch? Make sure you tell everybody how they can get in touch with you. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love to. Um, like you can see here we're at Illuminaries on Instagram or Illuminaries.net, and I'll leave I'll leave my information here at the end. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure how, if I'm good on time, but I'll kind of zoom through these. So yeah, just kind of got into various different fine arts and um, learning how to go from graffiti on big walls to small canvases was a big challenge um trying to learn you know how to how to fit things into a smaller space 
and this is uh, Berkeley Telegraph Avenue. Unfortunately, this building got remodeled. Um, this was, uh, I think it was the first or second building in Oakland to get uh, get commissioned as art. So this is the library, Lakeview Library. Um, this is a cool project here in Oakland. If you guys don't haven't heard of it, it's called the Guardian Project in West Oakland. They offer, they use the uh, the funds of the membership fees to pay to give free boxing lessons and workout training to any kids in the neighborhood for free. And they even give them tutoring services. This is called the Guardian Project on Adeline. So I had the pleasure of working with these guys. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about this this big elephant. This is the beginning of it. Um, and uh, this was such a challenge. This is one of those walls where the, when we started it, I kind of thought I made a huge mistake um, because I thought we would never, I walked up to this wall and I was like, how in the world? Uh, we went up, we, we ordered the lift and we ordered the one that was too small. We didn't even know how tall this building was. And we went up and the lift was too small. We had to order another one and just going up like halfway up this this wall and I was already scared shaking in my my shoes and so we eventually you know worked our way up and this is the sketch process I uh, a lot of people ask us how did we scale this up so big and we we got an app and we put it across the street on the roof and it was sending us photos every 30 seconds to my phone and so you can see here you know we, we used a lot of uh the red, the red lines is like our eraser. So we do a whole bunch of lines and then look at it from across the street and see, you know, if it was close or not, and then use red to kind of erase. And this, this was um, kind of what inspired that one. This was on uh, Broadway many years ago. You guys may have seen this on uh, 18th and Broadway. And then we kind of just scaled that up to be, um, to be the big elephant. And this is another shot. Actually, you can see that there, the Guardian Gym was next to that mural and then they just moved to, uh, to West Oakland. So this was, uh, this project, this was in, you know, the A's were looking to uh, make some political moves as far as getting a new stadium. And so this is, we caught them just at the right time where they had almost no uh, no budget cap on their marketing. And so they were open to any ideas that we threw at them. And uh, this was, you know, just such a, a cool project to work with. This is just a shot of just to give you how high it is. <laughs> this is. I'm getting shaky, nervous, just looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you come up with your, I, one other question we got here, Tim. You get a time check? Yeah, we got time, we got time. Uh, one of the other questions we have here, Tim, is uh, uh, how do you how do you come up with your ideas? What what what, what kind of yeah. process do you go through so, with your ideas? Yeah, it's a great, great, great question. Um, so yeah, as you know, transitioning from a graffiti artist to a mural artist and really, um, it, it has a lot to do with looking outside yourself. And now we're not talking about self-promotion here. The question I ask myself is what, what is going to spark joy or cause joy to the onlooker? And um, we approach all of our projects with that in mind is, is what do we want the end result to be? And what is the feeling? And in most cases than not, it's going to be joy and upliftment and, um, and so with that in mind, then we work backwards from that feeling back to the imagery. And as an artist, one of my secrets as an artist is I, I, keep, uh, I keep a huge um, library of images, images that inspire me. So I use Pinterest, I use screenshot on my iPhone. I probably have saved thousands and thousands of images and really just being like the I look at other art out there and see what inspires me and then incorporate that into my design. Um, also what 
you know, a big part of our, our uh, art is getting the community involved. And so this is a great example. The bottom of this mural, I, I knew the bottom of this mural would get graffitied up eventually. So what we did was we invited everyone in the public to come out. We left all of our paint on the ground and we said, go ahead and everyone just write your name there. And so uh, everyone tagged it all up and then we wrote Oakland is proud over the top of it. And uh, Devante would know the Oakland is proud is a is a big landmark that was destroyed probably, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, but it was a landmark graffiti by a guy named Fresh, one of the original graffiti artists in the Bay Area. And he did this, Oakland is proud down there on Mandela Parkway and it was up there for decades. And uh, so we, it was gone. And so we recreated that. Um, and so just to answer your question, yeah, what, what, in, yeah, we, I just keep a lot of inspirational things and and then we go back and forth and try to figure out um how th this particular one was we wanted to we just started studying elephants and and i we learned that elephants were actually used as war elephants a long time ago with just like war horses and so we just want to do our own rendition on you know what what might a uh a, a bay area war elephant look like that's kind of what i was doing that path um so let's see what else we got here i'll just move along move quickly through this one. i don't know how much time we have but another cool thing that happened out of this was we got to paint our own billboard so um this is a billboard that the a's were doing we had fans come out and write their names on it and then we painted over it a little bit and then they put that billboard up on uh this is on uh where was this grand grand and broadway this billboard what was up for a month and so and we went up to the top and so that was a cool thing because we we had painted billboards before but not not this legality you know legally so that, that was a cool thing this is a uh, oakland high uh, free uh, fremont high school in oakland and uh thank you to the voters of oakland many years ago they passed the measure measure j which uh funded the oakland school district with i think something like 50 million dollars to redo many of their schools so this is the result one of them they rebuilt uh, a big part of Oakland High and we were invited to paint the inside of the, the gym and so this is the they're actually using it as a vaccination center right now but uh, so the students really haven't been able to use it but we're super excited for the first home game one day and so we had we have a whole bunch of like hidden imagery in there you got birds and um little Oakland silhouettes in there and flowers. There's uh, butterfly wings. And so we like to hide a lot of things in there so that people maybe on their 10th visit, they, they'll see something new. You got little basketball courts in there. This was the, the gym, the fitness gym for the high school. And and we've just, and now, you know, transitioning, gr growing older, and now I uh, have a kid of my own, and we're just inspired. We've been doing a lot of uh, workshops with kids and trying to use, you know, everyone, every kid loves to use spray paint. It's so much fun. And we're kind of using the spray paint as a launching point to kind of inspire them to get into all types of art. And so this was a project in Union City, um, a year-long project with uh, the teen center down there, and we did whole bunch of uh, art projects with them and you know and so that I just I thank you guys for inviting me service above self that that really resonates and we are learning how now to you know and we're always looking bigger like how can we use art to affect more change um, how can we inspire more kids uh, how can we and you know the other thing that I like to do personally is you know, a lot of artists are not very business savvy. And so, you know, we like to teach. That's one of my personal missions is, you know, teaching artists more about business. And there was a gentleman on here talking about financial advisors. You know, I'm, I'm you know, that I like to do that. Uh, teach artists how to, how to save money, how to invest, how to uh, do sales, how to raise their value. And so that's one of the things we're doing around the Bay Area, just talking to artists and, and, teaching them a little bit about the business side of the art. Um, this was uh, in the Bayview in San Francisco, Black Panther. Um, 
we got the opportunity to work with uh, the old and one some of you guys may have heard of and one they're big a long time ago these this guy was uh famous back in the day skip to my Lou, and we were able to do a just last year we did a tour around the country to, to paint basketball courts in in um neighborhoods that needed it um this is one this is one in west oakland that steph curry funded um for through his foundation we got to hang out with him that day so i i generally you know if i have more time i just have a couple videos but if you guys have any questions please ask um, we, um, we have a few questions, I think. Uh, Susie, can you uh, ask them the questions that we have? Yes, on? of course, President says. So the Great Sandipa has a few questions. One, she's wondering about cost and with respect to scale. And with respect to the big mural, she's wondering how many people it takes to get something like that done. Yeah, so cost is kind of a wild... Uh, it, it could it could go all over the place um let me pause this it's kind of this um so cost yeah it, it could be the the big murals so we we generally do a lot of uh give back and free work to to the community as well so um but it's it's hard to say cost for big murals could be anywhere from you know up to a hundred thousand dollars down to ten thousand dollars so it's hard to say. It really depends on, um, you know, who, who's funding it and how, you know, how complex the design is. Um, but you generally, we try to bring in. I try to, you know, bring in as many artists as possible. Um, generally speaking, we work with, you know, three to four artists on that big on that big elephant mural. I believe we had about six total helping us. We were limited by the amount of lifts we had. We only had two lifts, so we couldn't bring in that many. Um, but yeah, uh, generally, you know, for, for the Rotary Club, if you guys got some walls for us, we'd love to, um, you know, possibly, possibly donate maybe for, uh, for, uh, cost of materials or something like that. Yeah. Wow. Well, that'd be great. Okay. So David Stein says, wonderful art. I love the A's elephant mur mural. Um, that was the Rotary meeting parking, um, lot before COVID. So what is the path to transition those who are putting graffiti on private property that has to be removed to positive art murals? Wow, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I believe, yeah, so there's a couple ways is what personally happened to me is that I had a job and my boss in Berk, he, he noticed that I was into graffiti and he was like, hey, you should check out this thing called Photoshop. And, and he got me into the digital side of it. Um, so personally, that's kind of the approach that I have, that I think that would help graffiti artists is, uh, I don't know, I don't know if you call the young guys graffiti artists at that point, you know, I know they're just doing damage all over, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, you have to fuel what they're into, into something that they can make money. I think the key is, is showing them that the same drive. So me personally, the same drive that I had when I was a kid, when I'm doing graffiti on the freeway, I literally am tapping into that same drive now when I'm doing a mural and it, it's still there when I'm doing art, digital art, it's, there is an aggressive competition that's happening in these kids. It's so much the, it's so exhilarating to go out when you're a kid and you can affect, and you have this little spray can, you can walk around at night and put something on the wall that everyone is gonna freak out about. I mean, that's just, that's so much power as a kid. It's hard to compete with that kind of power as a kid. So how do you convince them to not do that? And my answer is that there's a way I believe to show, to transition that same drive into, uh, into digital art, to graphic design, to something that's productive and, and yet they can still maintain that same drive of really, it's about getting exposure. You know, it's like, it's very juvenile. It's like, I just want my name out there, but you can do the same thing in other ways. So to answer your question, I, I believe that uh, fostering some of these, it's, you know, it's, you know, how do you do that though? How do you have a, a pro program within the city? Possibly, there possibly is a way, I think that you could, 
you know, once you know one graffiti writer, it's easy to know all of these guys out there know each other. It's easy to round them up. I believe that there could be a way to do a program that, um, that, that is, that helps graffiti artists hone their skills to get better. Cause when they get better, they're going to realize they can make money off it in a commercial way, um, through graphic design, through all kinds of ways. So I believe the way is to nurture what they're doing into something bigger. Right. So a couple of questions. Pauline Fox wants to know if there's a list of all your murals, murals and Leanne Alameda wants to know if there's a website where we can find this information. Yes, actually. So um, illuminaries.net and that's their illuminaries is how you spell it um, that you can see there at the bottom of the mural there. Um, illuminaries.net. We actually do have a mural map on there. I think it probably needs to be updated. It's probably a little while old, but you can see all of the pieces around the Bay and around the world. Um, and actually speaking of which, I need to recognize my wife. This is a mural of her I did in Albania. This is my first mural outside the US. And um, she uh, always believed in what I was doing when I didn't. So that, that was my gift back to her to, yeah. to uh, remember her. Wow, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Weiselman is asking, going back to the big elephant mural, how long does a mural like this take to complete? Uh, yeah, so the big elephant mural, it took, that was about three weeks. Um, that was a very large, that's about 10,000 square feet of, is that mural? It's not showing up yet. Okay, hold on, I'm trying to, uh, that's about 10,000 square feet and about, I don't know, maybe three, four, 500 cans spray cans and many, many gallons of paint. Um, that's probably the longest one we've done. Generally speaking, we're getting a lot faster now. I think if we could do, if we did that one over, we could do it in half the time. But generally speaking, we, we try to have our murals done within uh, four, four to five days. Great. Um, Joycey Mack is asking, I love elephants. Do you have a small frameable art to purchase? We actually do. Thank you for asking. Um, we we have. Uh, you can go ahead and contact me if this. But we do have one on our website for sale. Um, that is about uh, it's about 20, 18 inches long, and we have a panoramic view of this elephant. So go ahead and check that out. If you want different sizes, you can email me directly. I'll be on one of your guys's lists. Devontae can give you my info. Um, but yeah, we'd love to. You know get you guys some if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. I think you got it uh, all there. Any okay. questions okay. anybody has of uh, our guest? Hmm. Devante? I'm super excited, Tim. Thank you for uh, showing up and showing out. Um, you're an amazing person and amazing artist. You actually taught me a lot uh, in terms of getting me where I want to be. So that's just from me to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I will say one last, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, I just said one last little shameless plug. Um, uh, the elephant mural was not properly coated with a uh, UV protectant. So it's going to start fading in about three to four or five years. So we are trying to raise a little bit of money to um to rent a lift to, to do a proper protection on that the a's have uh, agreed to pay for part of it but not all of it so if anyone's interested in helping um donate to that please contact me thank you tim uh for being our speaker today this year our club is making the homeless crisis in oakland a priority to that end and as i give to you for being our speaker of the day in your honor, we are making a donation to support our unhoused residents in Oakland. Additionally, we would like to give you our Centennial Book, which documents 100 years of service and friendship in the third oldest club in the Rotary world. Right. Again, thank you, Tim, for being our speaker for today. Thank you all, appreciate it. Uh, thank you, uh, Devante, as well, for uh, bringing this program to us. We had a good time today. Uh, thank you, uh, Rotarian Kathy Dwyer. Will you tell us about our speaker for next Civic Thursday meeting?
Thank you, President Sess. So when you think about homeless people in Oakland, we often forget that many children are also homeless. So about 18 months ago, I had the privilege of meeting a woman named Trish Anderson, and she is what's called a specialist for the Oakland Unified School District's McKinney-Vento program. This is a federal program. It's designed to address the problems that homeless children and youth face in enrolling, attending, and succeeding in school. And basically what McKinney-Vento states is that um, every child, irrespective of their housing situation, is entitled to education. So as we know, life for housing insecure students is hard by itself. COVID and the subsequent closing of all the schools and reliance on distance learning made a difficult situ situation almost unbearable. So next week, I'm happy to say that Trish will be our speaker. She is going to come and explain what McKinney Vento is all about. She's going to talk about what she, how what, um, her job was difficult pre-pandemic, but how the pandemic made it even more difficult, how she had to pivot and uh, what the new needs are for this population and also how Rotary may be able to help these students and their families. So join us next week and come here, Trish. Thanks. We're excited about that. And uh, in uh, two weeks, our Civic Thursday meeting will be on Wednesday, Civic Thursday on Wednesday, featuring our former National Security Advisor, General H.R. McMaster. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for the tease. Uh, look forward to Rorak joining us in this meeting. But thank you, Diana, for the thought for the day. Welcome, Blue Badger Greg. Thank you, Jim and John, for introducing the ORE campaign. And thank you, Devante and the whole Rorak team for arranging this week's Civic Thursday program and speaker. Jesse, before I wrap up, do we have any bell ringers for this? We program? have two bell ringers this week. Uh, Fred Morse rang the bell for Tim and his fantastic graffiti art. And Jim Campanegro rang the bell for uh, Kathleen Sims and the great gala that she's going to put on for us in May. Oh, great, great, great. Always and, love to get any of those bell ringers. And, and Tim Lamont rang the bell. Tim Lamont. Tom Lamont. <laughs> Tom, I'm sorry, Tom. Yes. This came across. <laughs> so I'd like to end this meeting as we always do, and that's the way it went at the 5,334th club meeting on April 1st, April Fool's Day, 2021, at Oakland Rotary number three, the third oldest Rotary club in the world. Everybody remember, Rotary opens opportunities for service above self, and for now, this meeting of the Rotary Club of Oakland is adjourned.